you know, you need to hear it echo off the walls, so to speak. Fart in a rowboat is it's gone. Wait, is your preference the phone booth? Well, no, if you're... Because if if, mine is definitely the robot. Well, look, look. <laughs> Hi and hello, Arcanaut fans, and welcome to another episode of the Arcanaut Records. I'm here today in Copenhagen with Anders Brandt and James Thompson. If you've listened to the Arcanaut Records before, you will know that we are not your typical watch podcast. We dive even deeper than usual into the foibles of running and establishing a brand in this competitive industry. Today, we're going to be focusing on creativity, and to kick off the conversation, we're going to go right back in past and ask these two gentlemen exactly where their creativity originated. So, let's talk about this. When did you, Anders first realized that you were creative? Mm, I don't know, because uh, I don't really know if there's like a one point in time where you know, okay, uh, you get points for being creative. You d- certainly don't do it in school, so I had never realized actually before, you know, uh, getting being an adult, really. Really? Like I drew a lot uh, as a kid, but yeah. it's not like, uh, you know, uh, that s- somebody saw me and said, oh, he's creative. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't think uh, like the school system is actually like uh, made to give points to people for being creative. So absolutely. Um, I don't know. I, I, I never realized before I, I became an adult. And it's an interesting question because is it something you I, I don't even know if i was created a, as a child i probably was because you know I, I drew a lot and you know things like that but uh, i don't know if it's something that's inherited or if it's something that's learned or, over time basically because uh, the creative process can be many things you know the willingness to fail and you know just throwing things at the 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 wall and seeing what sticks, I think that's, you know, the thing that it, that makes me creative, at least. Well, let's say that you've now identified as an adult that you do have creativity and you're able to turn it towards, in our case, watch design. Do you look back on the way that you approach subjects in school, perhaps, and realize that that creativity was manifesting in a different way? Because let's take a, a regular subject like mathematics, you know, everybody has to study it up until a certain age and it can be done in many different ways. It can be seen and felt in many different ways. Do you think now that your creative streak was active, but it wasn't maybe noticed by you or anyone around you? I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Like, uh, funny enough, you, you think that math and creativity is like opposites, mm-hmm. but I don't think it is. No. Like, I, I, I actually... It, at school, I hated math, but uh, now I, I actually really like it because it's you can be creative with numbers as well. Yeah, you be, <laughs> you know, that helps. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure the tax agency likes you to be too creative. <laughs> with numbers, but. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but uh, you know, there's uh, there's beauty in math, and there's uh, you know, for example, in design, you can use math, and uh, you know, the in in your designs basically to 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 be creative but i don't know if beauty and creativity is actually the same thing or is it because i think o- o- often times you you look at people who can see beauty and create beautiful stuff really easily and then you say okay those people are really creative but i don't know if it's the same being good at for example drawing or designing stuff as actually being creative because creativity is taking something that doesn't have any connection to another thing and then mashing it together. That's creativity to me. Uh, and that's not inherently something that you, uh, you, you are necessarily, if you're a good designer, for example, you're not necessarily creative. You can create something that's beautiful and nice, nice looking, but that's not necessarily a very creative thing because you might be doing... You know, a nice shoe or a nice watch, but that's not inherently something that's maybe creative or innovative. So maybe we should draw a distinction between types of creativity, because obviously those things are being created, but there's a technical approach to it and a more artistic approach to it, I guess is what you're saying. And I guess 
we're talking maths and beauty and design. That's a more technical approach. And we see that pop up in watchmaking, but we see the exact opposite as well. So you can see watches that are designed based around the golden ratio entirely. Exactly. And I'm quite obsessed with that, as you know. But then again, you can take a brand like Artia that turns all of those principles on its head and uses inspirations from completely contrasting in industries to make something new and wild and exciting and it emotes and i guess that's the goal what about you james you are i guess the more typically creative amongst us in that you are clearly artistically driven and maybe don't have much of a technical approach other than the machines that you use what about you what about the start of your creative journey it has been so insanely hard for me to sit here for this two minutes and 20 seconds and not brutally interrupt Anders, because first of all, I agree with everything you're saying, and I completely am finding common threads in this, even though I think we really came from quite opposite directions um, in, this, in this whole process. Like, would you almost say that if I walk by a bus shelter and I spray paint my name on it and then I break the window, am I being creative? You absolutely are. It's, I, I don't really see a big distinction between that and going and painting a picture on a canvas. Um, I, think, I think creativity needs to be a little messy and a little gnarly and a little unbound. And as soon as you try and be creative on the clock, well, guess what? You're a designer. And that's a completely opposite process. But it doesn't need to be right because we can't look at a Rembrandt no. and say, oh, that technical skill that's been laid down on that canvas is worse or... But no, nobody looks at a Kandinsky painting and says, oh, yeah, 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 he, he used a number 12 brush on that part. Oh, man, he really did that at the right. You look at it and you get the emotion from it. Um, so d when did I start finding I was creative? Pro very early on, and a lot of it was not especially pleasant because I'm old enough that when I was in school, they didn't come along and pat you on the head and say, wow, James, that's very creative. They said sit down, shut the hell up. If you can't f focus on your own work, go sit in the hallway. And I spent the majority of elementary school by myself in the hallway because it wasn't creative. I was disruptive. Now, everybody talks about wanting to disrupt the industry. I disrupted the Calgary public school system, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, it was, and it was really, really horrible because I started feeling like every time I was doing something creative and every time I started walking off the edge of the map, I was inconveniencing you if you were the teacher. Mm. So it almost really became creativity for a lot of my, not a lot of my life, but it became kind of a dirty word. Mm. So it really wasn't until, I mean, I didn't go to art school in my first art school. My first art class was at art school. I didn't take art classes anywhere up through high school or anything. I still to this day can't draw to save my life. But having, having a creative mindset really just, I think Anders hit the nail on the head with it's about taking two different things and finding a connection with them. Um, that, that seems to be kind of the, the cleanest way of describing it. If you can describe something as, as intangible as creativity, because is creativity learned, is it inherited? Does it come from a pine cone that falls in some magic water in the woods? I, I have no idea. Um, my kids are insanely creative and it's, the most pleasurable thing in the world seeing because I like to think, oh yeah, you know, they got that for me. I don't know. I don't know if they did. Well, I think you certainly cultivate it now, don't you? I, I would hope. It's encouraged. Absolutely. 100%. I would hope that the schooling these days is also a little bit better at identifying that creative potential in children yeah. at a younger age yeah. and allowing them to explore it. I mean, I've, I've always had, this is going to sound bad. I've always had a chip on my shoulder about nowadays, it seems everybody in the school system, get some kind of a diagnosis. Oh, they're not problematic. They have ADHD. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're not being difficult. They're not being disruptive. They have some type of legitim legitimized. Is that a real word? Yes, it, it is. It is yeah. now. They have a legit disorder. And as soon as you put a name on it, it's kind of accepted. But if you're just hyperactive, hyper creative, can't sit still, you want to run around drawing dragons in the wall. In my day and age, you were a problem. Mm -hmm. Whereas now doing exactly that feeds my kids. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's some very difficult farming to get the insane creativity to a viable level and not just be somebody that runs around with a 
shoe on. But I mean, head. if you were going through school now, you would almost certainly get a diagnosis of some attention. Oh, a whole bag, disorder. a whole bag. I, right. I, I, I would put money down that I, I've probably slightly dyslexic, a whole bag of ADHD. Yeah, and the understanding wouldn't have been there. The perhaps, bourbon doesn't help. <laughs> no, no, no. But perhaps like your feelings, your slightly negative feelings towards the idea of creativity until you Absolutely. found your place and your people and your lane, as it were, wouldn't have blighted your youth. You wouldn't have felt so bad about it or, I don't know, dismissed. This feels like a perfect way to segue into my TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did a TED Talk in, in England in 2016 on exactly this subject. Humble brag. Humble brag, hashtag, <laughs> hi ladies. No, but it was about how you don't find the value in being creative or being weird, being an outsider. You don't see the actual value in that until you're older. I'm not selling it great, but you know. <laughs> how long was the TED talk? Uh, like 40 minutes. Oh, okay. I, well, good I, summary. I cried in front of 1,200 people. It was great. Oh, really? I got in trouble because apparently you're not supposed to say the F word during a TED talk. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well, that was always going to be a problem, I guess, for uh, you. Potty mouth. Okay, uh, so you did eventually find an environment in which you could express yourself, but as you alluded to, you can't draw. So what did that expression look like in the early days of you spreading your wings as a creative genius? Uh, by being obsessed with being funny. Okay. I, I How's that working out for you? Pause for laughter. <laughs> I, I kid you not. If I'm talking about like in, in my heart, in whatever's left of my soul... I get more satisfaction out of just getting a general chuckle out of the three or four people in the room here than I do out of the cover of Revolution magazine or some kind of massive legitimate work success. If I make a dumb joke and four or five people go, <laughs> nice, I'm smiling for the week. So how does that feed into actually being in the position of some responsibility in a brand? Does that burden stifle your creativity does it make it harder for you to be creative do you like no but it's a different it's a different kind of creativity right creativity can be like just opening a box of butterflies and they all go around all over the place mm -hmm. that's one type the kind of creativity that anders is talking about is much more focused and focused mature creativity mm -hmm. is something that i think is much more difficult to to maintain Anybody can just do a bunch of weird drugs and run down the street naked. That's being very creative and very entertaining. But to actually focus it into a business um, at, at the level that we are, I think that is, that is much more difficult because it is, it is a much more mature mindset that you need to apply to it, which I don't have. <laughs> well, you seem to be doing all right. You, know, you seem to be taking the tasks that are brought to you and running with them as far as you can. Pretty good. Do you think I am? I think that you're doing your best with what we're giving you. <laughs> doing my best with what I've got. No, oh, I, no I've had so many no, teachers I say that. I think you've got a lot. <laughs> and I think it is difficult to align an unbridled creative force like yours with a patient, methodical brand building strategy. Because we all know what it's like, right? You, you know, we've worked together for quite some time now. And, we, you know, I've followed your career for many, many years, you have an idea and the idea is all consuming. It doesn't really matter to your mind whether the idea is the next thing on the agenda or whether it's an idea. And <laughs> obviously that can be difficult when there's deadlines to be met or there are products to be delivered or there are concepts that we want to develop within a certain time frame so we can announce them as part of a progression for the brand. But from those moments where you've just gone off on a tangent, so many other things have come. And it's, it's about appreciating you needing the space to flourish because you'll fill that space if you're given it. And the opposite is also true. If we are too rigid and too constrained and say, look, I might say to you one day, I want you to make me five Fordite dials in the next fortnight. And you'll hear the words and you'll know what it takes to make five Fordite dials. <laughs> I know where this but is going. almost having that requirement is like, okay, yeah, now nah, that doesn't really feel like what I want to do. And in two weeks time, I'll go, so how are those five Fordite dials coming along? And you're like, ah, uh, yeah, I haven't got to them yet, but, but I, I joined the Navy. <laughs> yeah, I joined the Navy. I commandeered a vessel. I crushed it and I've made this new material. And then I'll go, oh, sweet. Develop that immediately. Let's use it. And the next day I'll call you and go, James. 
How's the crushed Navy vessel going? You're like, uh, yeah, I haven't touched it, but I've got five Fordite dials for you. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay, all right. So we have to like ebb and flow in that way, but it's working. It is working because we understand each it, other. It works because, <clears throat> pardon me, the, the, the work relationship I think that we have is, is, is quite unique. And I think if maybe if any of us was replaced with somebody else, it would be like an old West movie with just like revolvers under the table pointed <laughs> at each other, especially you. Cause I know I've, I've, pissed you off several times for that exact reason where it's been okay we're delivering the dark matter dials in two weeks we've sold this many let's make some dials I'm like yeah okay and then literally it's like when i i remember like when i was a little kid and you need to sit down on a sunday night and do your homework because mm. i'm dumb enough that i would leave my homework till sunday night and the instant that you sit down and start doing multiplication tables or something instantly within five seconds is when that little fairy comes over and taps you on the shoulder and goes have you ever wondered what happens to crayons if you put them in boiling water? Good question. <laughs> Who knows, right? And you, and you yeah. can't and you cannot for the love of anything get that idea to go away. So you have to see that through to the bitter end even though it's stepping on toes and screwing with schedules and probably making your guys life an absolute miserable hell. Um, so the fact that I still work here I'm pretty pretty jazzed about. Well, I, I mean, it's and I think that's why I'm paying for beers later. <laughs> Yeah, uh, definitely. <laughs> You're an essential component to the whole concept of Arcanaut. You could remove any one of us, and I'm sure you'll find a ball-busting, professionally-minded idiot to replace me easily enough. But he you does, two know. He doesn't know he's fired so yet. Much. <laughs> <laughs> I've been fired for about nine months, but the paychecks keep coming in. So, um, You're like the guy from Office Space. Basic, oh, yeah, we need to get branded staplers. I, could, I would love I that. I get the building on fire. I, I do love that guy. And he does Milton. set the building on fire, by the way. So just remember that. But... He did not get a piece of cake. What's important is that you have that time to discover. Like we came up with a couple of taglines for the brand. One was a single word tagline, discovery. And the other one, which is really what ties you to get together, is contained madness. I mean, it is mad what you're saying. You describe it from your perspective because that's your perspective. You say, oh, that thought comes along and you want to know what it's like to put crayons in boiling water and you, you just can't ignore it. But that's not a fact. That's not exclusive to you, but that's you. Like, that's how you operate. And you do everything you do at 100 miles an hour. So it's not like that you're a slow worker. It's not like uh, I'm sort of thinking, oh, he's not done anything. You've done something. I always know you've done something, whether it's creating patches off your own back or creating new AI versions of the Badger without any real application other than making the walls look pretty. You're doing something. And it, it is actually for a project. Right, okay. But it all comes together. It all comes together, right? And it all adds to the whole Badger universe. And what do you find as someone who, you know, you have your heart and soul in Arcanaut and working with that kind of creativity, which is very different from yours, how is it for you? Well, I, I think it's, uh, you, you need a bit of both because you need kind of like the, the destructive creativity and then you need the more you know, design approach, maybe the process of creativity. And you need to direct the creativity in some way. Uh, and in, in this company, I don't even see myself as the, you know, creative because we have James. Yeah, I see myself more as the probably the, the guy that's laying out the vision and then saying, okay, we need to go here. What do we need to do that? And then have the team actually work towards that goal. But if we took you and parachuted you into, think of a sort of more left brain mega brand, uh, somebody who's not insanely creative and weird, you you would be seen as like the, the insane drunken rock star wobbling around. Mm. It's just because you're in such a weird kind of rogues gallery in this room yeah yeah probably but i think you need you you find your that that's why i'm thinking you know is it inherited or is it a process that that and or is it a role because mm. if you're like thinking to a to to yourself every day i'm the creative person in the team then you're the creative person in the team but if you're thinking okay i'm the company head then you're the company head. If you're the visionary, then you think I'm the visionary. If you're the business guy sitting with the Excel sheet and you're telling yourself that every day, then you're the Excel guy with the, uh, the sheet. It could actually be fun to, like for one week, no, switch Anders, roles. No. Well, you know, <laughs> so we, no, we've just, sort of no. talked about it in the past, about what would happen if we all took the creative lead on a project. Because it's also very odd for me, because I'm normally 
Yeah. The yeah, creative yeah. one. And like within this team, because of the experiences I've had of, I, I would say, maintaining a facade of being a professional business person while also secretly being a <laughs> drunken rock star, I'm... I'm like the executor, shall we say, in more ways than one. Yeah. Like you define the vision, you add the creative source to it, and then I figure out a way to make it actually make sense. Rob's the gatekeeper. Oh, yeah. that's one way of putting I kinda, it. Yeah. No, but that's actually quite a cool way of, 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 of sort of paraphrasing that. But it is interesting to remind myself that my job is not necessarily to be creative in a design sense. Obviously, being creative from a communication standpoint or a brand presentation standpoint satisfies that creative itch. But there are times when we're sitting together, like we were in Dubai in November. We were sitting on the balcony, and I'd probably had too many whiskeys, as I think we all had, because it was the only thing we had to drink. And there I is, started spying out video some, footage. Like, some ideas, uh, like creative ideas, and you were like, why, why don't you ever say this stuff? And I'm like, well, because it's not really my place to be throwing, like, so many new ideas. Of course, we're all de- involved in product development, but, you know. I, I, I completely support you doing this, because I think the worst thing you can have is somebody to say, today, I'm going to wake up and be creative. I... I I think that just completely perverts the entire creative process Mm. or especially if, okay, we're in this group and my job is to be hyper creative. I mean, that's just such bullshit. You're just going to be completely pandering to, okay, well I'm going to, everybody's going this direction. So I guess my job is to pull the e-brake and go do something unrelated in the other direction. And then maybe your job Anders is to find a way to match the two of those together. That that's idiotic. It's I'm, it's like r- sitting down and saying, "Now we are going to write a song," yeah. instead of the song coming along, uh, you know, See? by itself. Or uh, write a joke, tell a joke, please tell a joke. Anders, I would like you to be <laughs> hilariously funny in four, three, two, one. Make us laugh. He is pretty funny to look at. It's the haircut. I think it's the haircut. But you've happened upon a perfect example there because. Let's take the first album phenomenon as an example, right? When you're young, you have all this creative energy and you have all this time because you've not had any success yet. And oftentimes people spend years letting these songs come to them because they just fall from them easily. And then they put them all down on a first record and they put it out and they have great success. And then a record company signs them and says, six months later, we need a second album. And then they do have to go into the studio and sit down and go, we're going to write a song. I was reading about Kylie Minogue this morning on the way in because... You too, so was I. I often do. Um, I think she won a Grammy. Congrats, Kylie. That's the second Grammy for Kylie Shout Minogue. Shout out Kylie Minogue. 20 years after her first. She turned up to um, stock Aitman Waterman in the 90s after she's had some domestic success in Australia with Locomotion, or The Locomotion as it was Good song, good song. Very good song. And they kind of forgot that she was coming. And she felt a bit disrespected about this after the fact. But in 40 minutes while she was waiting for them, they wrote, I should be so lucky or lucky, 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 whatever it's called. They wrote it in 40 minutes. It went to number one in like four or five countries, including the UK. It launched like the next phase of her career. It was a cornerstone of one of her greatest, most classic albums. They wrote it in 40 minutes because sometimes that pressure matters and it works if you've got the right stuff. But sometimes the planets are just in alignment. Dolly Parton wrote uh, I Will Always Love You and Jolene on the same day. Crikey. I'm 90% certain that was the two songs, but it was basically two of the biggest, incredible, you know, torch songs of all time. And she knocked them out in the same effing day. But the the, the question is actually, is creativity best when it's constrained or where you have total freedom? Because, uh, you know, if you look at the, uh, we've also talked about this a lot of times, like the constraints in, for example, uh, New Nordic Cuisine, has made some of the best restaurants in in the world. Uh, when you had the dogma movement in in fil- in the film industry, you created some of the best acting in any film. Uh, and and the question is really, if you had a hundred percent freedom to do whatever you wanted, uh, creativity, cre- creatively, would you be as well off if you then or would you be as well off as if you had the constraints of, for example, saying, now we need to come up with a watch in two minutes? I guess that depends what field the, you're in, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. If you're an artist and you're just an artist, not a painter, not a sculptor, not an installation artist, you're an artist and you just create and you can change your skin every single season and put out a new exhibition, then that kind of works. But we're a watch brand. And so we have to channel all of those ideas that could be. It, it needs to go somewhere. And I'm going to use the super mature analogy here of the difference between farting in a rowboat versus farting in a phone booth. Mm-hmm. Same fart, in theory. <laughs> it's never but the, the same. environment. You need this. Is, I'm being a child, but you you know you need to hear it echo off the walls, so to speak. Fart in a rowboat is it's gone. Wait, is your preference the phone booth? Well, no. If, if you're if because mine is definitely the rowboat. Uh, look, look. Answer this in the comments. <laughs> no, but in other words, creativity ne- needs to bounce off the wall. It needs to sort of reverberate and echo and give you something back. Um, now that fart analogy is just terrible, but <laughs> whereas if you're in a rowboat, if you're out in the environment and it just goes off into the wind. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. The fart is, it's a bad one you, to use. Do, do you see where I'm going here, Rob? I see where you're going. The analogy does make sense now. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you could try using a squash court or something as like an example of an enclosed space that, you know. The fart uh, wants what the fart wants. The fart wants. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I have a question written down in front of me I'm going to ignore because it says, talk to us about your relationship with color. And after that conversation, I really don't want to know what you think about that. So, <laughs> No, all right, so I want to talk about uh, your personal relationship with several aspects of design so we can figure out how important each one is to your personal processes because they're obviously very different. So I want to know, to start with, let's start with you. Let's talk about your relationship with form. In design, how important is that? Because obviously, many people will know you for the Arc Two case, which has an ergonomic form, very unusual, unlike anything else in the industry. How important is that to you, and where does that inspiration come from? Where do you see it? Mm, a lot of the inspiration uh, for you know the the designs that I, I I do is not in nature, but more in when when I watch a sci-fi movie or I'm a lot in, into sci-fi so or vehicles you know looking at cars looking at airplanes looking at uh, spaceships mm-hmm. that's where my my you know inspiration comes from but the interesting thing is then taking that and scaling it down into something that you need to uh, CNC mill and actually make in a small case design for a watch but that's also what what's interesting for me. It's that constraint. Like I, right now, I'm working exactly with that on something where, you know, the the fact that things need to be so small and you need to fit a movement in there that's a certain size. Well, that constraint is interesting because I need to look at that and then say, okay, I can't do this, but I can do this mm-hmm. and this. And okay, now it's actually more interesting because the form actually is much more interesting because I played around with it. And I think a lot of times it's it's not something where you're kind of like seeing something and then saying, okay, I need to put that into a watch, but it's playing around with the shapes and the forms and uh, the geometry like if you look at the you know a dark two case the geometry is, is complex in the way that you have you know complex shapes that you normally wouldn't see in a watch i would say because it's difficult to make that's basically it but it's an interesting thing to actually try and make so uh, I, I would say it comes from you know playing a wa- around with the shapes you could you know, in design school, you probably learn. I never went to design school, but uh, you you know learn to cut out foam. You know, and then then yeah. then then you go from foam to to des- to design, and you know cutting things out and actually shaping them. That's what I think is interesting because then suddenly something reveals itself. It's like uh, you know. See, that's a much stuff. more artistic process than just a purely design process, because. I mean, Michelangelo, I, I believe it was Michelangelo, has always sort of made a comment to the effect of the sculpture was already inside the rock. All I needed to do was just get rid of all the extra yeah. waste and the statue was already in there waiting for me. And that's actually really quite poetic that you would say that because I went to art school and design school and all this kind of crap. So I have years of experience of taking a piece of this blue foam, which is still one of my favorite shades of blue on the market, mm-hmm. and just shaving little pieces off and it didn't matter what I'm making a model of a cell phone or something 
And as that form starts to come out, the more material you remove, yeah. you start to you start to understand the form at the same time that you're physically creating yeah. the form. And that's a really beautiful sort of Mobius loop as compared to sitting and drawing something. I don't get the same connection that way as it's an actual physical piece. Yeah, now I would say in design, it's somewhat the same. It's the same because if somebody asked me, a lot of people have asked, like, can I get uh, see the first sketch of, of the Arc 2? But I couldn't show you the first sketch because there's hundreds of sketches. Mm -hmm. and I, have, I haven't even seen it. <laughs> there's so many forms, you know, intermediate, uh, intermediary forms that became that, but it's like, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different things that came into that. And it's actually sitting and drawing and drawing and drawing and then shaping on the paper, I would say. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the way that I design, because I don't really sketch as such, I, I do it with pencil and then, you know, a ruler and a, what's it called? The, oh, wait, the a compass. Retract. A compass, yeah. So you can also see that in the design just from... You know, it's it's a lot of spheres mm -hmm. that's put together in one, you know, design. So the first sketches are all, you know, hundreds and hundreds of different spheres that goes into one, you know, form. And then that form develops, 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 because then you're like sitting, okay, if I make this sphere a little bit bigger, this arc a little bit bigger this comes out and this comes out and this comes out. So it's actually like working with foam in that, a way. That's a really, really interesting and quite a sexy process to get to be a part of because if it was all just done with rulers and protractors, hey, you got a Bell and Ross. Woohoo, cool, I get it. But because you're talking about going back and interrupting the geometry of it, that's what makes it absolutely beautiful. Not just spheres. What happens when two spheres come together and you start getting rid of all the extra crap? That's really, really cool. Um, you know, you could say as, as, as good as the human eye is at detecting patterns, it's even better at detecting interruptions to patterns. So that little form tweaks like that, like, oh, it was a sphere, but I'm just going to put a little bit of a nudge to the southwest mm. side of it to just make it a little fatter on that side. That's something that even if it's subconscious or not, you will notice. Mm. And that's that's... Pretty, pretty advanced for somebody who never went to design school. I'm kind of feeling a little threatened here, actually. How did you get those sketches, those that massive evolution, I guess we can call it, like yeah. into a machinable file? At what point did you take it to somebody with those kind of technical expertise and said, this is my idea? And at what point was it really easy for them to understand it? Or was it just not easy at all? It, it wasn't easy to begin with. I actually had multiple people I worked with. Mm. Uh, but then I found somebody who you know, uh, uh, who was a friend I knew. And also it's a back and forth process because then, you know, we went from sitting and designing the, the case and then from what I had drew and then we found out, okay, this this angle is not possible because when you see in C machine something, and I didn't know this, but, you know, you need to know something about tooling paths and, uh, you know, there's certain shapes you can't make because the tool is round. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a, a, a 90 degree angle, internal 90 degree angle is not something you can just make. Not uh, on a CNC. No, exactly. Uh, so it's, uh, then we went back and forth and back and forth. Then we went to actually doing renders. Mm -hmm. And then that, that's where you actually see the design uh, interact with some sort of light. And then you're like, okay, we need to go back and change this part and this part and this part. because, And then you create prototypes. And then you see, okay, in real life, <laughs> when things are working together, it's not like I fought, so we need to go back again. So it is really an iterative process. Like, I think that during the watch, like just sitting, that was a couple of days where I basically sat from morning to, to evening and actually just, you know, with multiple spheres and actually working. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, Phil. <laughs> uh, Shout out, Phil. But actually going back and forth between between doing the CAT design, the 3D CAT design, that took months and months and months and months, and maybe basically a year, I think. Good grief. So you mentioned something that I want to pick up on and ping over to James. You talked about his interaction with light. Now, light is another very important 
element of design and something that you obviously are known very well for exploiting to the best degree. So talk to us about the importance of light in the way that you design dials or elements or cases or whatever. The details of my life are quite inconsequential. Pause for effect. Um, <laughs> Do we have canned laughter? Because we're going to need some. <laughs> oh, I've been waiting to pull that one out. Um, it, it, I would say it's, it's kind of the biggest arrow that I have in my quiver is through you know, quite a lot of experience with it, but actually using light as a physical design object. I think that's something that we do because this is all a collaborative effort that we do quite uniquely here is using light both as a positive and a negative thing. There's been some watches, some watches that I've done that had just massive amount of light output. Like you could use them as a landing beacon at the airport. I think the ones that are more effective is like we were saying about interrupting the forms. Light is great. What really is interesting is when you start putting interference between the light source and the viewer. Mm. That's something the first Sarpaneva watches did really well. Because if it was just a complete loom disc, okay, I get it. It's like this bloody light bulb that I'm staring into here at the recording. You lose the detail when you look right into it. If you look right at the moon, you lose the detail. You look off to the side a bit, you get something interesting. Clouds pass in front of the moon, it gets really interesting. So having, having light be both a plus and a minus, I think, is, is something that I really try and be aware of. Um, Can you give us some practical examples of no. that for people that don't? <laughs> Succinct answer, great. But let's, let's try and give people an idea of exactly what you're talking about when we talk about using light in design. A good friend of mine and another watch designer, Sylvain Berneron, Breitling and Berneron, yeah, yeah. and, you know, maybe soon to be Universal Genève, now Breitling's acquired the brand, who knows? He was a car designer. Hashtag hostile takeover. <laughs> at one point, and he actually would spend days drawing only the reflections that would be visible on a car. So he wouldn't draw the body of the car. Mm. He wouldn't draw the wheel arches or the oh, wheels. Man. He would just draw the reflections. And then he would see an almost ghostly image of that. And it's an image within an image and an object within an object. And in that case, obviously non-physical, but it feels like it's physical. You can see it shimmering within something else. Yep. Now that's super important to sports car design, especially classic car design. But how do you use it with watches? I mean, it's almost, I, I, I keep coming back to reference architecture in these things because what's every bit as important as the physical shape of the building is the footprint, hmm. is how the building is going to interact with the ground that it's sitting on and the environment around it. So with light, I mean, traditionally, it's really quite an easy afterthought. I mean, the real nitty gritty is you paint some glow crap on the hands and hmm, great. Having it be more integral into the design process from earlier on in the process. Um, can I think of an example of this? I mean, I think... Uh, it's weird. 20 minutes in, I hadn't mentioned... What about the black MBNF, lamp? But the black actually, lamp's a really the, good one, The right? black lamp is even better. And for once, I'm not going to mention MBNF, but the black lamp with Schofield is even better because that was one of the first uses... Someone's going to correct me on this, but to hell with them. The first uses of three-dimensional light. Light as a three-dimensional object. So when, when Giles kind of dragged me into this, <laughs> got me into this, um, we, we had an idea, he had an idea already in place of basically incorporating light into the outside of the case with this sort of loom ring that would kind of protrude through the case mm -hmm. and have this. And, and it was it looked dead cool, but it looked Tron. It looked Tron, which meant it didn't look Schofield at all because Schofield's a pretty damn classy brand. Mm -hmm. And it just looked wrong. But we used that as to sort of find the edge of the pool. Mm -hmm. And then from that, like pruning the bonsai tree, you start working back. And as we started removing more and more, what we found was even more important than how much light can this thing pump out was what's the light doing? Mm -hmm. How is the light interacting with the dial? How is the light interacting with everything else? So the way that I actually got that job, and I still have, <clears throat> pardon me, I still have the video on my phone, was I made a little, I, I milled a little ring of this solid luminescent material that I used to use, and I put it on the back of my hand, and I put two sunflower seeds on my hand to mimic watch hands because who the hell has random watch hands lying around, even somebody who owns a watch company. And you were able to tell the time, in theory, because the light was coming not 
just from the hands, but it was coming from the outside in. So as the light was hitting the leading edges of these goofy sunflower seeds, accidentally we found that, well, this is interesting. Now you don't need to put loom on the hands. And in fact, just the physical shape of the hand, if you just put a little bump at the, at the tip of the hand, that will more than adequately tell you what time it is. So this was, I didn't realize at the time, but fairly revolutionary that we were working backwards. We were using light as the result and then working out and getting everything else out of the way. Mm -hmm. That was quite cool. And I think that in the future, we'll probably revisit that concept even further with Arcanaut and try and take it to new levels. But looking backwards for a moment, I have a question for you regarding your design of the Arc case that is now the platform we use for nearly all current models. How do you feel about it now, years after designing it? Do you still look at it and think, wow, I can't believe that that came from my endeavor? Or do bits of it annoy you? Or is there enough that you want to do that's totally different for you to be satisfied with it as a project? I would say I, I'm, I, I'm more... I look at it and then I'm like, how am I going to follow <laughs> up on that? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder that as well, yeah. And that, that, that's the difficult thing. The curse so of the second album. I, I, yeah, I still <laughs> like it. But, but, but you know, it also sets a precedent to do something uh, wilder, differently. Uh, and, uh, or even less wild, but retaining the Arcanaut spirit. Yeah. Maybe harder. Uh, I yeah, was hoping yeah. you were going to say that. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. that, that might be it. But, you know, uh, so I, 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 I still love it. And uh, I, I know, you know, now if I were to design it again, I would do it differently because I'm a different person, but also because I know more about how to do things. So it's... Oh, that's the worst. That's the saddest thing I've ever heard, buddy. But, no, but no, that, no, 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 no. We need to protect you. It, but that 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 is, you know, uh, that, that is the that's the difficult thing to, as we talked about it before. It's the difficult thing to keep doing things that you, you know, saying we need to do this, and then how do we do this, and then let's figure it out later. That that's difficult when you already know. Okay, I need to go to you know, Koatek who makes the cases and then I need to talk to them about, you know, X, Y, and C. And then, okay, if to finish the case, we need to do this, this, and this. So it's keeping that naivety alive, I think, is important for creativity. Absolutely. Uh, and then also, of course, you know, it sets a constraint on me seeing the design that I did before because, not a constraint, but it sets a, goal for me to do something even better and or differently so do you think that it's actually a burden having designed that case and being associated with that case <clears throat> no it's a no not uh, I, I would say it's it's good because it sets you know the target high yeah i mean it's a bit like the creative discussion we we're having before where if you're if you're saying okay i'm going to be the creative one in this project you've already instantly kind of bastardized the creative process so if you're going to start the design process for a, a theoretical follow-up case saying, okay, <clears throat> how can I, what can I do that's better or more exciting than this? You've already kind of put the walls in you a little bit. Yeah. And that's, oh, that's... But sometimes but, creativity is hard work, right? I know it doesn't always feel like it when it's happening, and sometimes it feels completely impossible, but part of pulling all of these different threads together to make a watch and to make a watch brand is learning to work with such a constraining canvas. You know, the watch has to perform a function. It has to be wearable. It has to be aesthetically desirable. It, yeah, it has to be legible. Mm -hmm. So in addition to that, we also need to fit these watches that are being designed now into a story, into a path that makes sense to people that have bought watches in the past and might want to buy watches from us again in the future and people who are following the journey and waiting for their chapter to arrive. So how important is it to both of you, and this is the last question for this episode, but how important is it to build storytelling into a design? Is it something you think about? And if not, how do you expect your designs to be fitted into a overall canon that makes sense? I think uh, that's why we hired you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I think a lot of the times, or most times, that the story is already there. You know, with the Havender, for example, well, that 
the story, it's not something... W- with the watches we make, we don't need to come up with a story like, okay, we now made this, now we need to, you know, do how, some marketing. How can we to, dress it up? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We don't need that because the story is already in the process. Well, that's because we always go, why first, then what, then how? That's the order. We always <laughs> start with the why. That's, I mean, it was true, right? Because we were saying, oh, what can, we, what can we apply the same things we learned from Dark Matter to that is creative and might yield an interesting result. And James was like, oh, let's crush some muscles. <laughs> okay, we can try that. And the result, I mean, you've got a dial there that is just, you know, you've just finished it now. You brought it in with you this morning from Gothenburg and the color is incredible. And we've been working on this project for over a year now, I guess. I've seen many renders. I've seen prototypes. I've been there when the dust is in dust form and you've been sucking out of the air and, you know, holding on to every possible particle you can because it's so hard to harvest. And seeing that now... Hashtag health and safety. I wouldn't say I was almost moved to tears because, as you know, I'm relatively emotionless as a person, but in some way, (laughs) it really touched me. I was like, I cannot believe that you've taken something like a muscle shell and you've created a refined working product out of it that is so incredibly visually arresting. It's nuts. And it, it's so heartening to sort of be present for the whole developmental process. And yeah, it's my job really to communicate that to people. And obviously the Havender has got us a lot of interest around the world because it's just so bonkers. But I mean, because we always go why, what, how, the story of the product itself makes self makes sense within itself how do you feel about building products into a brand maybe this is less of a question for you because you're the unbridled creative force that kind of sorts out the what once we've come up with the why i'm just gonna drink my coffee and be quiet for a few minutes sorry okay over to anders when you think about design you're not thinking about not in the first instance anyway adding a next chapter to the arcanaut story that follows on necessarily from the one before in terms of a narrative you're probably thinking about it from a visual perspective the cues the things you've learned before and then you're trying to refine it develop it for a new application when it comes to that moment when you have a product concept and i know you've got a couple of new ones already that are on the horizon for anyone that's waiting for something new keep your eyes peeled what's it like then to start thinking does this make sense with the brand, not just in six months when we want to release it, but in six years or in 60 years time? Like, is this part of that narrative that we can sustain? I think I need to keep myself out of that. And that's why I have you as to to tell me, okay, this is really cool, but it's going to be even cooler if we release it in two years. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah, we have had that conversation it, once or twice. Yeah. That's what it, makes me crazy too. <laughs> because it's, uh, you know, a lot of the times timing is, you know, a huge thing if you want to be successful watch in, in the watch industry, in really any industry. And sometimes you need to sit on things for, for a while, while. Sometimes it's also, okay, this idea we need to get out now mm, mm. because we need to release this before we release this, or we need to do this in the succession of this, or, you know, there's a lot of different uh, reasoning behind it, but, you know, uh, so I depend on you to say, okay, this is the plan for the brand over time that we have talked about. But to for me to be real creative, I don't need to think about that. I just need to sit down and actually, you know, just create. Mm. And then... S- Sometimes some something will come out of it, and sometimes it's just shite, really. <laughs> Most of the, well, you know, as I said, creativity to, to me is the willingness to fail. It's willingness to sit down, use time on something, and then be willing to 99% of the time just lose. And not, Good man. But also that, in my mind, we need to do releases once in a while that that, you know, we just do, and then... We fail. We might fail, and we might want to be willing to fail. For example, with the Havender, that's just a fucking cool concept. And from the beginning, we were like, <laughs> we don't care if that sells, because the the process, the things that we learn, and because we think that is the coolest thing ever, it's just something we need to do. And I'm super happy to hear you say that, buddy. I'm, I'm 
getting proper fucking emotional over here. <laughs> I only ever cared about making one of these because this was something that I wanted to have and I wanted to be remembered for. So the fact that you guys are quote unquote getting it is, is the proudest thing of the year for me. Well, so are the people that bought it. And I think to be honest, that's a good place to wrap this up before you burst out in floods of tears. <laughs> I'm thinking I think about you it. Need a break. Okay. Well, thank you for sticking with us through that conversation about creativity. We're going to be back in the pit in Copenhagen with Anders and James, and unfortunately me as well, very soon with more insights behind the scenes into the brand of Arkanaut. Stay safe and keep on ticking. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was a good one. Jesus. Oh, we could wow. uh, we can do the um, This Watch Life outro. Have you heard it? The new podcast with Vu and Lydia. Bye. Pretty good. Kylie Minogue, watch out. Kylie Minogue, watch out.